Today's show is brought to you by Anduin. Anduin is revolutionizing fund management with digitized fund subscriptions and marketing data rooms that streamline operations with real-time status updates. We all know traditional paper-based subscriptions are costly, tedious, and rife with errors. In fact, up to 80% of submitted documents are likely incorrect. Anduin's investor onboarding workflow improves the investor experience, bringing clarity, guidance, and efficiency to fund subscriptions, drastically reducing error rates. For more information or to arrange a demo, visit fundsub.io slash capital allocators. Today's show is also sponsored by ThirdBridge. ThirdBridge is a widely used provider of expert interview transcripts whose clients include past guests on the show. Their content covers both public and private companies in any sector across all the major geographies around the world. To give you a sense, last year, over 16,000 investment professionals from 1,000 firms across private equity, public equity, and credit downloaded approximately 500,000 interview transcripts from Third Bridge Forum. Each of those transcripts covers a one-hour in-depth interview between an unbiased sector analyst and an industry executive. I've seen the platform and the coverage is incredible, ranging from mature mega caps to leading edge innovators like Stripe and SpaceX, to thematic topics like crypto exchanges and alternative energy in China, to just about everything in between. ThirdBridge created this category of research and has by far the largest content platform available. If you're an asset manager or capital allocator looking to better understand your manager's positioning, visit thirdbridge.com slash capital for a try. Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. Mark Andreessen from A16Z famously proclaimed a decade ago that software is eating the world. His prophecy has proved prescient. Cloud computing enabled the rapid, cost-effective deployment of software, startups flourished, and venture capital returns have been phenomenal. Venture capital is a fascinating investment area whose many days in the sun shine brightest this year. Institutional portfolios with large venture allocations soared to their best year in history. And yet, parts of venture are unique in being both efficient and unactionable. Many believe that Sequoia or Benchmark will produce returns at the top of the pack, but there's not much action anyone can take to participate. This miniseries explores the industry, focusing on some favorites of institutional investors who are still investable to those in the loop. Each has a great differentiated story to share and something to prove. That said, this field moves quickly, so as the disclaimer goes, Past accessibility is not a guarantee of future capacity. My guests on the 11th episode of Venture is Eating the Investment World are Renata Quittini and Roseanne Winsek, the co-founders and managing partners of Renegade Partners, a venture capital firm they launched in 2019 after each experienced life inside top-notch venture firms, Renata at Felicis and Lux and Roseanne at Canaan Partners and IVP. They raised a first fund of $100 million to focus on the super critical stage of a company's development. Our conversation discusses the dynamics of a venture capital spin out and the nuances of a stage focused strategy. First, we dive into their backgrounds, lessons learned from their experience, forming a partnership and strategy together, and going to market. And then we discuss Renegade's investment process across sourcing, filtering, winning deals, and working with companies. We close with perspectives on the competitive landscape, battle for talent, and areas of growth internally, including the application of our mutual friend Annie Duke's decision theories to the practice of venture investing. Ventures Eating the Investment World is brought to you by Omni. 
Omni helps private capital investors track and analyze individual deals while providing comprehensive financial and legal insights across their portfolio. It houses the largest database of investment transactions in the private markets extracted directly from executed agreements, including the legal terms, co-investor details, liquidity preferences, valuations, and round sizes. With that information, investors can make faster investment decisions, benchmark deal terms, understand market trends, and enhance portfolio analytics. Omni's clients include leading venture funds, corporate venture groups, family offices, and endowments, including a number of past guests on the show. You can learn more at omni.fund. That's A-U-M-N-I dot fund. Please enjoy my conversation with Renata Quatini and Roseanne Winsek in this, the 11th episode of Venture is Eating the Investment World. Roseanne, Renata, great to see you. Great to see you too, Ted. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Uh, This is going to be so fun. I would love to kick it off with your backgrounds and path to Renegade. I actually started my career as venture investing in funds, um, venture funds, the NLP for the Stanford Endowment. I used to be a lawyer, moved from Brazil to the US to get a postgrad in law. I wanted to be a lawyer into VC in 2004. So that's how it all started for me. And then got my MBA at Stanford. One day I looked up, oh, Stanford put venture funds in business. Let me actually find a way to see how that all works. And I was very lucky that right place at the right time. And that was 2007 when I got into the Stanford Endowment and global financial crisis on one one side of the book and then venture going through a big transformation on the other side of the house. And this transformation of seed and product market fit changing, right? The 10x cheaper to start with AWS, global distribution channels, et cetera. And all of a sudden, the institutionalization of seed and micro VC starting funds and Stanford was a natural stop. And I ended up realizing, oh, wow, there's something changing here for founders. And I ended up building a basket for Stanford at the endowment. And then in another lucky move, got to know Aiden at, at Felices and Sandeep. And in a give and take situation, that belief of investors can come from any background. I've been at Stanford Endowment for three years and have allocated and understood about portfolio construction reserves and have seen the best in the business from the inside as an LP. So I brought that to the table and they said, you know, we invested before, so why don't we join forces? And that's how it went from the LP side to the GP side and was at Felices for almost seven years and was an amazing ride. And then from there, I went to Lux Capital. I met Josh and Peter at the Stanford Endowment, saw Josh in a suit (laughs) <laughs> which is a very rare event, <laughs> bringing a briefcase and endo materials. And we stayed friends and co-investors since. And I went to Lux to help build and invest companies in the frontier space. And while at Lux, I've known Roseanne for more than 10 years now. That's what led me to the path to Renegade. My background is like super similar to Renata's. I grew up in Ohio. I was a chemist. I actually started a PhD in biophysics and about halfway through my PhD, I realized I like thinking about science and talking about science, but I didn't really like doing science. And I was here in the Bay Area. I went to Berkeley and was living in San Francisco and saw tech taking off. So I did what everybody with half a PhD in biophysics does, which is start a company that made Facebook apps back in the crazy <laughs> Facebook app days, which was really fun until it wasn't like I was kind of that entrepreneur that Renato was talking about where like companies are 10x cheaper, right? Like we were, you know, using AWS and Facebook and we had scraped some money, like, you know, we raised a tiny bit of money and we're off to the races. And that was really fun until it wasn't, right? Like Facebook, A, shut everybody down because everybody was making money on their platform and they weren't. And it was also September, 2008 happened right after that. And our parents looked at us, like we were all just out of school and our parents were like, you need to get jobs. Like, what are you doing? So I actually went to a venture back company after that. One of the board members asked me, he's like, what are you thinking about doing when you grew up? And and I was like, I'm thinking about maybe going to business school. And he said, have you ever thought about venture? And I remember going home and reading everything I could and thinking like, oh my God, this is my dream job because it was everything I loved about academia, right? Like the building mental models and trying to create a, a vision of how I thought the world works. But instead of pipetting is my experiments. I got to talk to people and that was just a much better fit for my personality. And so I went to Stanford, just kind of gung-ho wanting to go into venture. I joined Canaan Partners, early stage firm out of business school, which was awesome. I'm still super close to that team. It was like really great training. And then a couple of years into that, IVP approached me asking if I had ever thought about growth. And 
frankly, I had it. I feel like I was so lucky because I joined IVP in the beginning of 2015 and kind of had this front row seat to watch the growth market change, which that was the summer of the unicorn, right? Like everybody wanted a billion pre and that seemed so crazy. And just watching the trajectory of those companies and it was just such a great seat. But in my heart of hearts, like I'm an early stage investor and every deal I wanted to do was like well, just too early for us at IVP. And as Renata mentioned, like I we've known each other for a long time and we were at one of those dinners in 2018, just kind of like a VC dinner. And by the end of the night, like everybody's had a lot of wine and, and we're all just kind of talking about like, well, if I started my firm, I would do this and I would do that. And Renata and I were like kind of finishing each other's sentences and we'd worked on a bunch of stuff together in the past and had this great friendship. And I like pulled her aside and I was like, maybe we should talk about this for real, like with less wine. And that's kind of how Renegade started. It was like nights and weekends that year. And then, you know, in two weeks, we're going to hit our three-year anniversary of telling our firms and quitting our jobs. I really want to dive in to some of these dynamics of a spin out in the venture world and maybe start with before you decided to do this, what were the most important lessons each of you learned, say Renata from Felicis and Lux and Roseanne, you can talk about IVP and Canaan. So something that's really cool and complimentary about our backgrounds is that my venture career has been at new kids on the block, right? So Felicis, it was the first institutional fund, this whole idea of a startup and building a startup venture firm and developing a brand and everything that that entails. And then Lux, which right now they're on their fund six, but also a new kid on the block relative to the big institutions. So I had this experience of what really resonates with entrepreneurs and how to really build unique and appealing franchises. So with with Felices, the biggest lesson for me was around flexibility, right? So when we started the firm, Seed rounds were called it 500000 to a couple million dollars. And there were so many adages around, okay, f- fixed ownership or some people that were very dogmatic about investing certain dollars amount, et cetera. And we actually took a broader approach to early stage and said, you know what? We know the venture is a power law business. And as long as you invest in companies that will return a significant amount of the fund, you can have a wider aperture of the types of companies you target. And then the first investment that we kind of did that broke the mold was Angry Birds, We had this big thesis in mobile and mobile is a new computing platform. And okay, what are people doing with mobile? They're messaging, they're reading news and they're playing games. And we identified Angry Birds as a target. And the round that we participated in Angry Birds was bigger than the fund size that we were investing at the time. The check size was order of magnitudes bigger than the check size we've written before. But this idea of like, okay, if you can invest in those power law type of companies, you're fine on a cash on cash basis. And then at Alux, it was really the power of the brand and how do you get in that founder mind share, right? So like if you're a founder building things in frontier and tough space, like Lux is a top three firm that you talk to. And so how founders perceive you and do they know when to call you or what to call you for is something really critical. And those were my two big lessons from my prior firm experiences. Renata's so right. Felicis and Lux are these new kids on the block. Like IBP and I'm pretty sure Kanan are like both older than I am. They've been around for a long time. (laughs) And the big things that I really learned at at Kanan were really about portfolio construction. Like they have a really interesting strategy that they do tech and healthcare out of the same fund and have like these really diverse teams around the table. And I was there for the fund that had, they, they led the series A of Lending Club. And I was in the fund that Lending Club was in and, you know, when the company went public and just watching how allocation of reserves and right and how you think about putting big dollars behind your winners and how that can actually like just really change the fund dynamics was such a valuable lesson and something that we talk about a lot here. And then at IVP also for me was a big inspiration in this category creation around like being stage specific. Because you know when IVP regrouped after Redpoint spun out in 2000, they decided they were going to focus on growth and like there weren't really people doing growth investing back then. It was kind of seen as this, like, we were kind of doing IPO arbitrage. And I think that they planted that stake and built a really successful franchise around that. And also, like, just the benefits of being a stage-focused investor. Because the truth of the matter is, at IVP, we were stage-specific sector agnostic. And so I know just that my consumer companies, my enterprise companies, like, yes, they have different customers, but the, the company building and growing issues that they were dealing with were the same. And that's one of the lessons that we've really taken into Renegade. And I really am a staunch believer in around 
you're best able to help companies when you know what they're going through and also know what it has to look like on the other side. I'm really curious about this potential tension between, as you thought about where you wanted to invest, Renata, you talked about learning about the value of flexibility. And Roseanne, you talked about learning about the value of focus in a stage. Those two things may not go together. So I'm kind of curious how you figured out what you wanted to do. Yeah. So I think the focus piece is like, what is going to make founders talk to you? What is top of mind for founders? And then the flexibility is around portfolio construction and the way, how can you create as many opportunities to work with these companies as you can, right? So one is around how do you attract those opportunities? And that's the focus. And then the flexibility is, okay, as many ways as possible to say yes to those great opportunities. Yeah, I do want to dive into how this all came together as a business in the competitive landscape, but it probably makes sense to chat a little bit about how did you distill those respective lessons into renegade strategy? We really wanted to answer the question of why does the world need another venture capital firm very, very well before creating our jobs and investing our careers in building renegade, right? And so I've come more from earlier stage companies as compared to Roseanne, right? And she comes more from growth. And what we're seeing is there was so much help around the venture ecosystem to help companies figure out their product market fit. And when it came to really building out their organizations and building out their teams, this was a defining moment for companies. Everyone sees that capital availability is tremendous. And when we look at, okay, where does that money go? It goes into team and it goes into marketing. And this idea of how do we build the teams and organizations that scale was really differentiating the companies that would get large amount of funding down the line and would really continue to be outliers. And chatting with Roseanne, she would go and say, these companies are raising hundreds of millions of dollars and they're still so raw. Yes, they have revenues. The business engine is evolved, but as organizations, they're still so raw. And we really kind of grokked into that notion of there was something changing in the way organizations evolve. And we actually internally, we and dearly call it the teenage years of companies, that there's this very distinct phase of your product is working, you have your customers, you're having this pool, and you're really building that people infrastructure to continue to scale. Once we grokked onto that, we couldn't let it go. Yeah, I think our mission at Renegade is to be the best firm in the world at identifying companies that are about to go through this inflection point in their growth that we call the super critical stage and help them outperform through that. So super critical stage company we define as, you know, the sandbox is like 20 to 100 employees, early revenue up to maybe a million dollars a month. They're generally raising rounds that are between 10 and $50 million. We don't think the letters really matter anymore. But when you're 30, 40, 50 people, there's foundations and systems that you can build now that will like just help you be more efficient down the road and also save you a lot of really common headaches. And that's really a lot of what we focus on. We actually ran an analysis of companies that raise money from 2016 to 2021, companies Series A, Series B, Series Cs. On the, the mean round size has gone up about twice. They're raising twice as more money. But also the number of people that they have by the time they come to raise that money also increase at least twofold. So a company at a Series B on average used to have about 50 people five years or so ago, and now they have... 80 to 100 by the time they come to raise that Series B. So you see that velocity and that exponential pressure. And then when you go to talk to founders around, okay, now you're really spending 50 plus percent of your time thinking not only about who you hire, but like, what are the roles you need in your org? How do you compensate these people? What are the types of profiles you're going to need to execute on your financial plan two to three years from now? And their eyes just go really big because they're all obsessing about that. And that's the focus. And that's the super critical stage. Like now companies reach out to us and say, I'm a super critical stage company. I want to talk to Renegade because of that. So when you guys decided to launch this firm, you'd known each other for a long time. What was the difference between that and becoming partners in a business? There was a lot of work between that dinner and telling our firms. And here's the thing is like, we respected each other, liked each other as people. We respected each other and liked each other as investors, right? Like one of the first things we did was open up our track records because I had a close friend who was starting a firm with somebody who had misrepresented their track record. And so like we wanted to get out there first thing, like totally open the books and the here is our actual performance, right? Making sure that we're really aligned there. And then the bigger thing was around 
Can we be partners? Can we like bet our careers on one another? Because like at the end of the day, we didn't have to do this. We had great jobs. So we had like seats that people would kill to have, like great firms that loved us and that we love. And like, we went to go do something crazy. And so if we're going to do something crazy, we got to believe in one another or better our careers on one another, right? And so we actually hired a coach, Khalid Halim, who we love. He did some marriage counseling with us. And it was a lot of work. It's also like the soul searching of codifying your own values, what's actually really important to you, and making sure that you're well aligned with the person that you're working with. And the point that you brought up earlier around tension between focus and flexibility, having tension in areas like that is so important in a business. It's so important to have making sure that you have multiple points of view and like multiple styles around the table to make sure that you are holding each other high standards and adaptable and and effective. But where you don't want to have tension is on those core values. And for Renata and I, when we really peeled back the onion and got to the heart of why we wanted to do something like this and what was important to us and what a meaningful career meant to us, we were extremely well aligned. And it was things around Renegade is going to be the last place that Renata and I work at. And we want it to be better when we leave than it is today. We both really believe in how do we set up a firm that can be generational and phenomenal and hand it off in a way that creates momentum for the platform. Because we see so many venture firms today just struggling at their core with generational transfer. And so we talked, we got ahead of that right away and talked about our own retirements, even though we're in our 30s then and already talking about that stuff. And so it was really getting down to the core things around what makes career meaningful for us and what's exciting. And a lot of the ways that's manifested in Renegade is like we wanted to build a firm that looked like a company that we'd want to invest in. And we wanted to like feel like entrepreneurs that we would invest in. And the way that we invest in our own business and compensate ourselves and compensate our team is much more like a company than it is like a traditional venture firm. And like making sure we were really, really aligned on those things was so important. What's an example of something that you learned about each other in that process that you didn't know and that you think would be somewhat broadly applicable to sort of partnerships coming together? I think the crucial tool that we learned is we're very different people. And Roseanne is a massive extrovert. I am not. Can we make that a powerful combination? And we found, and through the process, we learned exactly how to get the best of each other and how to deal with each other in like a really, really productive way. But we kind of knew that about each other before and that was getting the tools. But I'll say like, for me, it was in the little things. So Roseanne is actually tremendously generous. And one thing that stuck to me, we were sharing a hotel room once. And well, many times we shared hotel rooms. But <laughs> there was this one time that I saw her leaving a tip for the cleaning person. And, and that stuck to me as just like generosity and principles and things that were not expected as just like really important values. When it comes to, okay, how do we talk about carry? How do we talk about our comp and building the business? Those are conversations that we had, but like also knowing how the person is and the trust and the consistency, you also have what it takes to kind of back up the behavior. So, you know, LPs ask us a lot about tension and disagreements and they're expecting very excited animated stories. The truth is we have zero. Our biggest disagreement was over one slide in a fundraising deck a long, long time ago. (laughs) We have a lot of productive conflict. We have different point of views, but we know how to deal with it. And we have a lot of very important, difficult conversations, right? So one of the philosophies we have is, and then going to the value of be like a company you invest in, right? So we want to over-invest financial resources in building technology infrastructure, in hiring amazing people, in doing all of that. And that also means that the way that we share economics, both cash and carry, has to kind of back that up. And those are so easy conversations between Roseanne and I. So once you figured out that this is a partnership that you both felt good about, what was it like going into a market? So just to kind of put a temporal dimension on it. So that was beginning of 2019. So we hit the market around May of 2019, April, May. On one hand, we're known entities with a known track record and known firms. And 
gosh, we got so many <laughs> meetings. Getting a ticket to the dance was very easy and everyone wanted to talk to us and we had LPs from prior firms and other relationships. But, you know, like just the backdrop too of the market, right? Like funds were coming back to market bigger and faster than they were before. So actually differentiating between the people who wanted to take a meeting versus people who could actually invest in, in new relationships was a lesson that we had to learn on the field and something that we iterated on quite a bit. Some folks spin out having anchors defined. That's not how we approached it. That's not who we were. We went through so much. It was a big learning experience. I think the thing that we learned that we probably took too long to learn and I wish we had learned sooner was just around like qualification. There's a lot of people who will take a meeting that can't invest in a fund one or never have or structurally they just can't or they can't invest in a funder size or their allocation is done for the year. And these are long term relationships. It's important to start building those relationships. But at the same time, like really understanding who can invest and who can't early on is so powerful because your time is such a limited resource in all of this. And you can only meet so many people every week and only spend time with so many people every week. So as you look back, were there rules of thumb that you saw of, well, it was really the LPs that knew you before that invested, or those LPs really didn't invest because they didn't want to upset your prior firms? The word that comes to mind to describe the people who came, they were believers in the strategy. They understood that the supercritical stage was something that founders were going through. We didn't need to, we explained why it was valuable and how we were going to attack it, but like they saw value in that. Of course, they challenged us and we loved that piece in the relationship, but they were believers. One other thing too is that I kind of wish we had learned earlier is that when you're raising a venture fund, some people you talk to are dedicated venture investors, right? And they know everybody and it's kind of like talking to another GP. They know all the players, they know how the market works. And then there's people that like manage a big alternatives program and they might be talking to like a timber fund before you or distressed credit and know nothing about venture. And like also understanding where that investor is at. And the truth of the matter is most of our investors are really savvy venture investors. I think for, especially for early funds to be an emerging manager, getting people who really understand the nuance and understand the value of being an emerging manager are the ones who really lean in and move forward. So I'd love to turn to how you've gone about implementing this super critical stage investment strategy. And maybe we would just walk through it. How do you go about sourcing these ideas? One thing about super critical stage companies is that they've raised capital before. And so that does kind of help constrain the universe. Of course, everybody today knows who has raised capital before. So that <laughs> also means that you you need to be very focused on like who you're going to spend your time with and who you're, you aren't. And so we think about it in a few different ways. We tend to be broadly thesis driven. We have like a few big themes that we like that can manifest itself in many ways. We spent a lot of time right after we closed the fund looking at a lot of payments companies. Stripe is a $100 billion company. It's a payments company that's focused on merchants. There's trillions of dollars that still go through paper checks and POs. And we were looking at a bunch of horizontal platforms and thinking about that. We really thought the payments world was going to be more verticalized for in these large industries. And so that led us to invest in built technologies that does construction loan management software and also payments for for construction, which is about a trillion dollars a year in the US. That led us to invest in Nate, which is one click checkout for any merchant on the internet. So like any commerce payment provider where the customer is actually the consumer, not the merchant. And so it's a really interesting one because it puts a bunch of incentives on their head. There's some broad theses, but then also it's the general like blocking and tackling of going through our seed fund, seed investors that we really admire, scouring their portfolios, trying to find the ones that we think are really interesting, getting in front of companies early, trying to build relationships. The thesis ideas help us identify what's important early on so that we can try to move quickly and be really efficient in diligence. In this world where velocity of capital is moving so fast, how do you balance this interest and you're hunting for these companies that other people have invested in that are doing well with wanting to do your own diligence? So one of the things that we did when we first started Renegade was working on what does a Renegade deal look like? So actually having clarity on what the parameters are and what do we think really creates value in companies and what is our heuristic? So we kind of have a little bit of that 
that blueprint and the process, even before investing in companies, right? And then we're looking for outlier business engines and what does that mean for Renegade or companies that have 10x products and what does that mean? And what kind of information do we want to see and look at? You know, for example, we really love digging into cohorts and looking at quality of revenue, right? So like we know because we've invested in many other companies before and we've seen outlier companies before what we're looking for. And then the other piece that we do as well is... So we work very closely with Annie Duke, decision scientist, poker player. Like She's been very instrumental in many things at Renegade. But one of the things that we developed together was scorecards on evaluating companies and also what are the questions that we want to ask each company as we meet them so we can figure out our plan of action really early on. What are the important questions for that particular business? Because some things are fatal and some things are not. You're never going to find a company that's perfect. But actually knowing in advance what's the key information they need to have and what's the make or break for that particular business really allows you to move with conviction and fast. What are some examples of like those types of questions? We think a lot about fatal versus fixable as kind of a framework that we'll use. Is this something that is fatal to the company's outcome or is it something that can be changed? Things that end up being fatal are deep customer issues. Often when you look at companies at at an early stage, marketing is not efficient. CAC might be low, but it's because it's against a small number and those are your most excited users and can that scale. And and often it's trying to dig in and figure out, is marketing inefficiency due to a mismatch of product market fit? Are you just getting there based off of discounts and promotions? Or is this because that infrastructure isn't built yet and you can hire that team and you can optimize that? So one example of that fixable fatal framework that we think about is back when I was at IVP, I led the series B of Glossier. And at the time, like it wasn't obvious. The revenue was all over the place. And it was because they were selling out of products. They couldn't keep stuff on the shelves. They would get stuff and it would sell out. And then obviously revenue is zero for a product that you can't sell. And digging into the data, that became obvious. And it was like, oh, like getting better at forecasting, getting better at inventory management, or also the company was capital constrained, like having more capital, being able to hold more inventory is a totally fixable problem. On the other hand, like they had a product that was flying off the shelf. If that was the issue, that is fatal. If it was a product that people didn't want to buy, like that's a fatal issue. But something like not having enough capital to hold enough inventory or not having great revenue management function yet is totally fixable. So like we're really looking for things like that, like digging into those areas and trying to understand what is fixable in these early stage companies because nothing is perfect and what's actually like a core fatal issue. A lot of the work that we do with Annie is around structuring our process in a way so that we can really iterate on it quickly and also help us really tease out like what are the things that actually mattered in these investments and how do we identify them faster in future diligence processes. And so how that works is we do what's called like a decision exploration table. It's in... I think her how to decide book. And so looking at when we make an investment, it's looking at what are the positive potential outcomes, potential negative outcomes, and which are driven by skill and which are driven by luck. And kind of mapping that out for each investment. And the questions are about for the things that are skill-based, how can you increase the probability of those skill-based things happening or, or lower the probability of the negative ones happening? And for luck, like how do you make yourself lucky or how do you hedge for things that are completely out of your control? And so what's really powerful about that exercise is what it's really telling of is like, what do you actually have to dig into in the diligence process that's going to be make or break? And that helps you kind of front load the next company you invest in the following process around like, okay, here are the pieces and the questions that actually really mattered. And let's put the other stuff aside. Because at the end of the day, like you can boil the ocean, you can have all this false precision, but like it's about being efficient and making sure that you are focused on the things that actually drive the business and not just diligence for diligence sake. Once you get to this point where you're interested in a deal, how as a smaller new kids on the block, do you win deals, presumably against you know, competition? I think that's where the super critical stage insight is so valuable. You got to understand the business. You got to understand the market and that's stable stakes, right? So how are you going to work as a board member, as, as an advisor? So prior experiences, but then you move to very quickly to, okay, what's top of mind for you? And we explain to them what the supercritical stage is. We explain to them that we have Susan and other resources. And these are the things we've done for companies A, B, and C. And 
founders self-select, the ones that really get excited by it and the top of mind that they will need that scaffolding, they lean in. And then the question becomes quickly around, okay, how can we show you how it would be to work with us? So for example, one thing that we do is option pool calc even before investing. Let's look at your hiring plan. Let's look at the option pool you have, the option pool that you want to create. Do you have the financial and the equity capital to attract all these people? Let's actually kind of help you think about leveling and stuff like that. And then they see the value of what it is to work with us and how this is really accelerating for them. And we also get so much insight on how it is to work with them and what's important to them, how they're thinking about hiring, what are the more important positions. And if they're thinking about entering a new market, are they staffing against that? Or how are they thinking about, let's say they need to increase sales org and okay, so how are you thinking about the number of resources and productivity? You have the leads and it becomes a much more organic diligence conversation that way as well. To your earlier point, Ted, I'm like, it is like focus and flexibility. It's like the focus of this is what we do. This is all we do. We're obsessed with this. What's super critical, like the, every company lives in this. This is like what we eat, sleep and breathe every day. And then on the other side, like flexibility. And our fund one is $100 million. And in a sea of giant funds out there, it's actually kind of differentiated to have a small fund. And often when your fund is really big, you can either lead a deal or not do a deal. If you are investing out of a billion dollar fund, you have a minimum check size that you need to hit in order to make each deal worth it. And with our fund size, we have a ton of flexibility. We love that in that like we have a lot of ways to win. We've led big rounds like companies like Daily and Nate. Nate was a $38 million Series A. Daily was a $40 million Series B, right? We're able to lead those rounds. And at the same time, we're able to be smaller investors in great syndicates. That's Coda and built loop returns. And so giving ourselves that flexibility, the truth is, is like venture's a power law, right? You want to be in as many great companies as you have. And for us, like we have this additional tool that we have multiple ways to win. Once you're in the deal, how do you define what that supercritical stage is and how you're going to help companies ascend it? The big insight is what we talked around. Okay, teams getting bigger sooner and getting bigger faster and just talent and execution being where the rubber meets the road. We're at a moment where HR or this need is so latent and transforming, but actually not a lot of people know how to do this job of the chief people officer. And you're seeing companies that are billion plus valuations that are searching for those very rare talents and they can't afford it. And we know that early stage companies have this very latent need. And you know, if a big unicorn can't afford it or find it, let alone a series ABC company that absolutely needs it, to put that infrastructure, that org machinery that's going to continue to execute, they can't be competitive on that. And then we said, okay, what if we brought somebody who's an operator that companies would kill to have, that has this experience, that has done this before, that works as a partner in our firm, that is the scaffolding resource for them that can help them navigate through that. And that was our first hire, a chief people officer, a woman named Susan Albin. She was an operator before. She actually was at eBay, PayPal, and then she went to Uber Eats. She was the first GM in San Francisco, grew the business from zero to 100 million in revenue. And then she went to Zoom Pizza at 30 employees and this realized, oh, wow, you know, I've been at these companies where markets are huge, velocity is huge, capital is abundant, the big problem is people. So let me actually move into the people function because she, you know, a very, very smart woman. And she was there from 30 people to over 400 in, in less than three years scaling all of that org in like a very complex business. So this is a person that knows how to do the job and she's full-time with us and she helps scaffold a lot of our companies and it's a huge accelerant for our companies. Each company has something different that's top of mind for them at every single time, right? So there are companies that are going to engage with us thinking, okay, I need to bring in a head of product, a head of sales because I don't have it. Or there are companies that are saying, okay, I'm, I have this flat product and edge organization that is now the time to split this in two and how to actually think about staffing that. And that's how we start the relationship. A lot of companies are coming to talk to us about comping and leveling because you're seeing salaries go up, competition for talent getting bigger. And how do I make sure that I'm not only competitive, but I'm compensating my people in a sustainable way. A lot of them are engaging in that conversation, but we actually have sprints with them. That we go and say, okay, what is top of mind for you for the next six months? We come up with a, with a plan and then we revisit what's top of mind for the next six months. How do you go about solving that 
key compensation issue in this world where talent is getting more expensive and is more competitive? That is something that everybody is feeling right now because right, like, talent is a market and so much capital on the system means that market is also a very hot market. And there's a lot of data that's around today, but frankly, like all of that data is backwards looking. It's not real time. And so that's something that we do a lot of work with our companies on. It's a really common thing that comes up. And frankly, it's often a combination of data, either Susan or a compensation consultant. And also a lot of it is around like precedent setting. Everything you do here, you have to realize you're going to have to do again. And so a lot of it is about how do you set up a system that you feel is generous and fair and aggressive and lets you get what you want from a talent perspective, but at the same time, you're comfortable with and can sustain. If you do something for one person, it's going to be expected again and again and again. And so how do you actually try to systematize a lot of that to make it fair and equitable? I'd love to hear your perspective now that you've been in the market investing in companies the last couple of years about where you see yourself in the competitive landscape and how it all is sort of playing out in real time. I think in these processes, like one thing we always ask CEOs is, what are you optimizing for? What is most important? And there are CEOs who the most important thing is like speed and valuation. And as Renata mentioned earlier, like there is some self-selection in this. Yes, you want to be in the best deals, but you also want to work with people who align to your worldview. And we're big believers in our worldview. We also think it's a it's a worldview that generates long-term value. I don't think that shotgun marriage venture rounds are tried and true recipe for long-term value creation. And so I think in this environment, you just really have to understand who you are and what you offer and where you're good and what you don't do and what you're not good at and what you're not going to win. We're not going to win on fund size, right? Our fund is smaller than a lot of other funds. And so if it's really important for a CEO that they need to have a very large lead to lead the round, like we're not going to be that partner, but we can be a participant or we can figure other things out. But that kind of self-awareness and then also getting in front of them and talking to the CEO about what's really important. Often it's making sure we can bring a specific investor into the round or specific ownership target for somebody. It's this the kind of multidimensional optimization. And I think what's been really helpful for us is this attitude on working together on it and also just being very upfront about where we're great and what we don't do. What's been most frustrating for you in the environment? For me, is just how the incentives are so misaligned because the abundance of capital and the velocity of capital makes investing in companies, you know, for certain funds and certain dynamics, almost like cheap options. And for founders, that's their one shot. That's their career. That's their livelihood and their employees' lives, right? That's their most expensive endeavor. And so much in the system now is almost free money, cheap, cheap options. And that is extremely frustrating because it's it hurts company returns. It hurts employees' ability to participate in those returns. And it also hurts LPs' returns in the end of the game, too. So that is extremely frustrating. How have you thought about the pace of deployment? So I think for us, it's pretty easy. So fund one, you're never as aligned with an LP as you are right now, and you can't afford for this to fail. So we're focused on investing in outlier companies. We're not speeding up, and we're doing our work to make sure that the companies that we invest in, we have high, high conviction or high expectation that they're going to be top quartile performers. That's the non-negotiable. And the environment is crazy. Some funds are two years or less are coming back almost every year, and that's not how we do this. So as you look through your own supercritical stage, what are the couple of things that you are very excited to sort of get to in your development as a firm over the next couple of years? I love this question. When we had our first close of Fund One, we had this thesis about the chief people officer. We felt really strongly about that, but then like in getting in the nitty gritty of what is this offering? What does it look like? We did this exercise that we called monkey in the mirror because it was the Trello board stock photo was this like picture of a monkey looking at itself in a mirror. And it was a lot about like, okay, what are other venture firms offer? What do you want? And what's the area that like is not being offered and you wish you had as an entrepreneur? And really like that's where we focused. And now as we expand, we're kind of doing that again. We love this people function because basically companies at this stage have like a structural disadvantage in hiring senior people talent. Because the truth is, is when you're 20, 30, 40 people, like being ahead of people is not that interesting of a job because you're also running HR and setting up systems. It's not strategic yet. 
and a great person can get a job at a 5,000 person company. And that's a way more interesting job. And so it's a little bit about us helping fill that gap between where you are today and where you are when you can go get that talent yourself. And so what are other areas in company development that are similar? I'm not a big believer in the outsource kind of agency model of let us do everything for you because these companies need to build this expertise internally. But what are aspects of company formation where there's companies have a structural disadvantage, this type of talent, just by virtue of their size and their stage? And how can we kind of fill that gap? And so that's an area that we're actually actively working on right now. Kind of like, what's the next practice, right? Like, what's the next area of excellence? Who's the next Susan on our team to fill a similar gap, but in that same kind of partnership consultive way where we're not going in and doing this for the company. She's paired with an executive that can can implement these things, but provides a strategic resource. I have a different answer. Well, yes, and. So one of the things that you know, we really believe in is how can we learn from our own decisions and how can we make better decisions as we go? So we built this infrastructure and processes that were like capturing so much of every decision we make, every company we meet, a lot of super forecasting mentality of, okay, what is the probability of this event going to happen? And we're collecting this corpus of information with the certainty that at some point, we're going to have this proprietary data set of like how Renegade thinks and decides and also better understanding like, okay, what are Roseanne's spikes? What are my spikes? What are other people's in the team spikes? And I think two years from now, we're going to start to get some more meat to go chew on because right now it's just really planting the seeds with the strong belief that this is going to be massive and very meaningful. So I'm excited for that. It sure sounds a lot like Annie's handiwork. I'd love to ask sort of what other things have you learned from working with Annie that you've applied to venture investing? We use a lot of the super forecasting kind of techniques around venture itself is very hard because the cycle is very long, right? Like it's seven to 10 years. And so we try to pick up in our kind of, we do a lot of forecasting and calculated Breyer scores around like what are short, medium term endpoints that we can try to forecast and see how good we actually are at reading the market and measuring the market. We also use a lot of that same type of forecasting and probabilistic mentality when it comes to like our own internal processes like fundraising, thinking probabilistically, evaluating things. The first thing where the rubber met the road was, so we had a first closing of our fund and we knew we were going to have multiple closings and we didn't know for sure what the end state of the fund size would be. So the first thing we did was create multiple portfolio construction models for different scenarios. So this idea of scenario planning and what do you do in different scenarios and what are the probability of those scenarios occurring? How do you adjust and what do you need to see to adjust the way you think? We apply that to portfolio construction, but we apply that to many, many other things. The way we do our follow-on process and how we think about company markers and what we need to see way ahead of a process being in place, right? Because we're all endowed, we're all human, we love our companies, all those things, and being ex-ante, like what are the progress markers you want to see to really want to double down and having that constant, the type of information that we collect on interactions with company and feedback and the way that we store signals is definitely another thing. And and one thing that we're doing too is really identifying what's the one thing that matters for each company, the monkey and the pedestals, the way that she talks about it. Because there are many things that are progress and that need to be done, but they're not what's going to make one company unique or defensible. So understanding for each company what's the, the one thing that they need to nail to really be spectacular. We live in this world of uncertainty, but we behave as though there's certainty and there really isn't, right? And so it's really about tools around like, how do you actually acknowledge that uncertainty and grapple with it? Because we had our first close on Friday, March 13th, like the world was about to shut down. Nobody knew what was going to happen. We never knew if we would ever be able to close another dollar after that. Remember, like the world was going sideways. And so we were hopeful that we were going to raise more money and we did. But at the same time, we had to like make do with what we had, but also make sure that the investments that we made made sense for that fund size and then also the potential final fund size. And that work was so helpful. And also like, it's such a phenomenal tool to get through these crazy events where like the world is going sideways and your priors are thrown out the window. Well, Roseanne Renata, I have to ask you a set of closing questions before I let you go. So why don't we kick it off with what is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Roseanne, why don't you start? I am like a big puzzle person. 
I like love puzzles like crossword puzzles, jigsaw puzzles. There are these puzzles called Liberty puzzles. They're like the most beautiful puzzles in the world. Renata? For me, it's music. I play now mostly the guitar and that's something I do daily. I recently started a jazz trio and it keeps me creative and listening. Also, Renata is like a hyper talented musician. Like she's very like, oh, I like to play guitar. But one time, again, we were sharing a hotel room. We were at the Ace Hotel in New York and there was a guitar in our room. I like was playing some song for her like on YouTube. And I think I played like four seconds of it. And then she just started playing it. I'm like, who are you? Like she's incredibly (laughs) talented. (laughs) Uh, Renata, what's your most important daily habit? I got to move physically, physical activity. Roseanne? I am like a crazy phone person. So the phone does not sleep in the bedroom is like my biggest one. All right, Roseanne, what is your biggest pet peeve? What's been just driving me nuts lately is this irrational optimism sometimes or like not recognizing what's actually not conceding that there are things that could potentially go wrong. And it's sometimes just so hard for me to deal with that. Not that I'm like a pessimist, but I just I really love to be grounded in reality. (laughs) Renata? For me, it's like I try to be present in everything that I do. And for me, when people are multitasking or when I'm interacting and other senses are doing something else, I feel like I'm not fully being listened to. And that drives me nuts. How about on the investment side, investment specific pet peeve? I don't like surprises. Be open. We're partners. Just too many surprises or changing the numbers or not being able to trust. It's the hardest one for me. Roseanne? It's like reporting. When reporting changes, like that drives me insane. When numbers are presented in a bunch of different ways for different things, that just drives me nuts. Roseanne, which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? One of them is this woman, Judith Klinman, who was my undergraduate research advisor at Cal. And she was the first female physical science hire at Berkeley. And she was just amazing. And also like told me I could do things I never thought I could do. And then I mean, the other one's like Renata. She's really changed my career. Well, I'll mention that the two people that brought me to Roseanne. One was my constitutional law professor in Brazil. I was about to quit law school because it was really boring. And he, number one, not only like challenged me intellectually, which was really fun. He had an LLM from Harvard and he was the first person like, have you ever considered leaving Brazil and going study in the U.S.? Like really literally opened up my world. And the second person was John Powers, who's the CEO of the Stanford Endowment, who gave the Brazilian lawyer a chance into a completely new, different life. Would not be here if not for both of them. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Both my parents had amazing professional lives, and they were also extremely present. I never felt that them being fulfilled was at their expense of their experience with me and my brother. Like They were always there for the little moments. And the big moments. So, yeah, I think you can have it all in that regard. And I'm a parent today, and that's huge for me. Roseanne? My dad used to always say, like, whatever you be, be a big one. And it's kind of in this idea of, like, whatever you do, you're going to spend, like, your life doing it. You're going to spend a lot of time. So, like, you might as well, like, do a great job of it. Like, be great at it. I don't know. That's been a driving force for me forever. All right. Last one. Roseanne, we'll start with you. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? When I was going from science to startups to venture, like that was a very random walk. I can tell that story now and it sounds like it makes a ton of sense. At the time, it was, I really struggled and felt so lost and so that I had like made all these giant mistakes in my career. And I wish I had not stressed about that. Looking back, it's like all of that strange path I took is like what makes me interesting. That's what I bring to the table. And that's actually like so much value in my life. And I wish I hadn't beaten myself up so much about not knowing because like that part of your life, I don't know, you should sample and wander. It's amazing. Renata? The imposter syndrome, letting it be too big for too long in the sense that it was freezing me from things or stopping me. And I just realized, you know, pursuit of mastery is a different thing. There are always gaps to be filled. And now I look at those with excitement and, and curiosity. And for a while, that was pretty heavy. And, and freezing. Great. Roseanne, Renata, thanks so much for taking the time. This was so awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Super fun, Ted. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com 
where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.